you remember when MC Hammer decided that he needed a massive image change? So he changed his name to just Hammer. Well, meet the Suzuki S-Cross, the car formerly known as the SX4 S-Cross. A car that wasn't groundbreaking in any way, but it was a sensible, competent, and very reasonably priced family crossover. And it therefore lasted an impressive eight years. So you might say that it was... You might. So now we have just the S-Cross. SX4 is so 2021. And to be honest, despite that major relabeling, it is basically doing exactly the same thing, pretty much. I'll expand on that, obviously, but that really is all you need to know. So if you want to, you can stop and watch something else. Don't though, because this might do the same thing as it's always done, but now it does it in an altogether better way, really. Oh, there's no MC Hammer clip for that. Damn it. <laughs> Sorry, I'll stop that now. It is officially no longer Hammer time. So what exactly is this thing now then? Well, for a start, it's got SX4 written on the tailgate and on the floor mats, even though Suzuki UK just calls it S-Cross now. But I've already made MC Hammer jokes and they do technically still work, so let's move on. So this is still Suzuki's family crossover, the sort of thing you'd get instead of a Nissan Qashqai or a Peugeot 3008 or a Seat Ateca or a Citroen C5 Aircross and so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. To infinity and beyond! Except Suzuki already has one of those, right? This one. And it also has another one of those. This one. A car that it was so desperate to have on its books, in fact, that it took a Toyota and it wrote Suzuki across the front and the back of it. The thing is, though, the Toyota one is proper expensive. It's like 45 grand. And the Vitara, it is a bit cheaper, yeah, but it's also a bit more utilitarian it's a kind way of putting it this thing is more squarely pitched at the fat family runabout market fat runabouts that is not fat families but still with value as its core principle it doesn't cost much more than the Vitara but it does cost quite a lot less than most of the other fat hatchbacks that I mentioned before there and it's got loads of stuff as standard almost certainly more of it than all of the cars that it's priced largely on par with or a lot less than yeah, and that is definitely a thing to think about. So now that Skoda and Hyundai and Kia have moved up market in every way, it's basically left MG and Dacia and Suzuki here to play the value card. So while this is a bit more expensive than the MG HS and the Dacia Duster, it also feels a definite level up in terms of the stuff that you get. And more basically, it feels a little bit more well-engineered, a bit more hefty, and that puts it in a good place. Your standard car looks like this. Proper high-end car spec sheet that, innit? Parking camera, keyless entry, dual zone aircon, heated front seats, smartphone mirroring, and absolutely loads of safety stuff. Now, Euro NCAP hasn't quite got around to smacking it into a wall yet, so its rating is TBC. But honestly, there's just no way that you're getting all this stuff in a basic Volkswagen Group crossover, say. It does make you wonder what they could actually add to the other trim level, the upper one. There are only two, right? And it turns out it's basically leather, uh, a captain bird's eye view parking camera a big sunroof navigation and oh yeah four wheel drive good system it is too we'll get to it the point is this is not a car that you need to bump up to like a 40k list price to make it feel loaded to flip even the engine range is simple it's not really a range it's just a thing one of them this one it's manual as standard and if you want an automatic you pay 1300 quid regardless of spec Simples. So this is a 48 volt mild hybrid as standard. What that means is it gets a tiny little electric motor and that assists the engine a little bit low down, gives it a bit of a torque bump, but also helps the start stop system work a bit better. So you'll find that even when the car's really cold, you've just switched it on, the start stop will work and it will kick in before the car's come to a complete stop. It can't drive on electric power though. The result is a petrol car that does a solid 45 to 50 miles per gallon. And that's a thing that Suzuki points out is superior to other similar stuff in the class with similar power and petrol engines. And bonus, the MPGs don't really degrade that much if you get an automatic. It's like one or two miles per gallon difference. E, 129 horsepower on a car this size. I better couldn't pull the skin off the race. Putting that, man. And that's kind of true, um, Geordie. It's better than you think. Oh no, wrong again. <laughs> so most of its torque is 
in your pocket, so to speak, at around the 2000 RPM mark. That's because it's a booster jet, which means it's a turbo and also a little electric motor. And that means you don't have to really work this engine too hard, which is a good thing because when you do, it sounds gruffer than Sean Dyche with a hangover. I have gravel for breakfast. That was another thing. To be honest, it is one of those setups where you do have to work the gearbox quite a lot. You can't be lazy with it. So if you come to a junction and you're in third in like a diesel car, you can probably get away with pulling away and you probably do, but in this you can't. Joe, do I just look super casual and cool and I'm leaning against the car like this or does it look like I'm so cold that I can't be bothered to stand anymore. But the other reason it doesn't need big horsepower is because this is commendably light. It's only 1300 kgs at its heaviest, which is some kgs less than your archetypal two ton SUV. You do the math. So obviously it doesn't feel like a nimble sports car, right? I didn't really need to say that, did I? But that weight thing does help it ride with the sort of quality that you want from your day to day family wheels just soft it's a bit floaty to be honest you would just describe the whole driving experience as adequate pleasantly adequate though so again it's comfy in a basic way because it feels soft but in turn that means that the body does roll quite a lot it pitches when you brake and it rolls left to right when you do a corner but not too much and actually the steering is very much on the alacritous side it's proper light and the car does turn in pretty quickly that makes it feel kind of lively almost and this is where the whole all grip thing comes in the four wheel drive thing it's actually a very clever setup putting the car in front wheel drive mode most of the time for the sake of efficiency but always monitoring what's happening with the throttle and the steering and the traction control and then if needs be coupling up the rear axle and sending as much as half of the torque back there now it's not an off-road thing really it's a traction thing it helps you get out of your muddy or snowy parking space but it's also a sport thing i was not aware of that yep put this in sport which i haven't i will there it is i mean to be honest with you it doesn't feel any different at all there's no real extra weight of the steering i mean you'd even expect the accelerator response to be all dicky but it's not feels kind of the same but what is happening is that the four-wheel drive system in sport mode is more keen to send the power rearwards if it senses that you need a bit more grip there it doesn't make the car fun right but it's just nice to know that you have that understeer safety net exactly face says it all there in it <laughs> this is never riveting to drive but it is the sort of car that if you've spent some time just driving it around the doors and then you decide huh, i'm gonna go into sport mode and i'm gonna find a back road and i'm gonna see what happens it's probably a bit better than you think it's gonna be a bit more feel through the tires than you think now i do think that when it comes to drivetrain decisions you should save your money on an automatic and just stick with a manual it's not the last word in smoothness in the way it goes through the gate it can be a bit lumpy sometimes notchy but the pedal feel in this car is brilliant and that's something that Suzuki has always been really good at they're physically spaced out really well there's lots of room they feel kind of hefty but without being over heavy the brakes are really nice they're dead progressive and they're powerful enough obviously and the gear ratios are set up for economy they're quite tall and that's a good thing because that's what you want in a car like this to be honest choosing a manual is more about just it fitting with the feel of this car the automatic is obviously going to give you that bit more convenience but it's a bit retro it's a six speed, it's not a twin clutch, and it's not the sharpest shifting thing in the world either. But mainly, I believe that this is the only four wheel drive crossover type thing that you can have with a manual, so that's unique. If I'm wrong about that, please do let me know in the comments by calling me a hurtful name. That's the way to do it. <laughs> but you know, it's obviously more important how this thing behaves as a family car. You know, space, flexibility, comfort, the stuff that'll matter to you day to day when it's not snowing and when you're not doing a track day in it. And on those basis, it actually performs really well. So dimensionally, it's pretty much exactly the same as the outgoing S-Cross. And that means that it's a little bit on the smaller side as compared to most of these family crossover things. Now you might like that because it means it feels less bulky and it's a bit more maneuverable around town but what it also means is it's on a slightly shorter wheelbase than most of these things and that means that it's not the hugest most capacious cabin in the class the boot is a bit of an awkward shape too because of these big old suspension covers here and by volume it is on the smaller side although it will be enough for most it's a whole it'll do the job and a twin floor is standard as is a split folding rear bench 
handy. Now the cabin here has taken a decent uplift over the outgoing car, but to be honest, it still feels a little bit anachronistic. The quality feels mostly fine, but you do end up thinking that if this had come out in 2013, you'd be like, yeah, it's neat, but it's just not very inspirational. So for example, if this sort of thing matters to you, it's only got one small portion of soft touch plastic. It's there. So if you've got someone in the car and you're trying to tell them how good the quality is, just make sure that they only poke that bit. Yeah, this is the place where you can really feel that the traditional budget brands, I'm doing air quotes around the word budget there, have started to pull away. Look at the class gulf between this cabin in the Suzuki and the one in the new Kia Sportage, for instance and even the one in the Skoda Karok. It basically feels the same way from a general operational and refinement point of view as well. So there is lots to like about it. Again, it's comfy and the visibility is really good because it's been designed with a sense of simplicity. So you do notice very quickly that the front screen is massive and the glass house in general is really large. Big old rear screen. Suzuki seems to have taken the opposite design approach to say Toyota. Just as an aside, I think it looks a bit like a Mitsubishi as well. So, you know, if you're missing those guys, Here's the car for you. <laughs> Anyways, the basic ergonomics are generally great. Again, really good pedal placement, lots of adjustment. However, the one thing I would say, if you're on the taller side, then you'll probably feel like you want the seat to go down quite a lot lower. I feel like I'm perched up too high here. And because of the headroom thing, and the fact that this has got a sunroof, I just feel like my bonnet's a bit too close to the roof lining. So if you're taller, you might feel the same way. And then basic usability is just that, it's kind of basic. So it's nice to have separate aircon controls down there because you can quickly adjust the temperature if all of a sudden you have a hot flush or something. But then once you get up to the touch screen, it is a bit laggy. You have to jab on these haptic buttons at the bottom to get the volume up and down, and I just don't like doing that. And also, it's one of those systems where just feels like you're surfing menus a little too frequently. It's like a lot of these lower end systems, to be honest with you. It's not terrible by any means, but it does feel like it's been designed more for graphical fidelity than it has plain usability. It's hard to get that balance right. Now in refinement terms, it does what you expect it to do. It is not the most refined crossover on the market by any stretch of the imagination but you will note that its primary quality is comfort and lightness. And then the fact that there is quite a bit of tire noise and quite a bit of wind noise probably won't bother you that much. And it's certainly not catastrophic. It is one of those cars that is very, very good on the motorway as well. So if you're just sat at 69 miles per hour in sixth and it's not a really windy day, you're gonna be dead comfortable for many, many miles or kilometers or yards or fathoms. And all that is why it's difficult to pitch this as anything other than something you get because you value um, value above all else. There's nothing wrong with it. It's very good in many ways, in fact, but there's nothing really memorable either. The Peugeot 3008, yeah? That looks great and it drives even better. The Qashqai feels higher quality and the Kia Sportage is just the best of these family crossovers now. Really, that car feels a whole generation ahead of this in terms of cabin ambiance and tech and refinement. I think I do prefer this to the MG HS though, I think. Like, that thing's got a nicer cabin slightly, but this is a bit better to drive and it's got the all grip advantage. I don't know how I can really decide this. What would help? I said we pray. Oh yeah, we pray. I'm fine, thanks. So there you go, thanks for watching. Please remember that if you want the most cost-effective way into one of these, then check out leasing at vanarama.com. That applies to any new car. If you could subscribe to the channel, that would be mint. I'd really appreciate it. It would mean that you are doing great. And thanks a lot. Cheers for watching. See you soon. Bye.